the chosen crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down, come on. Brothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, fathers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, fathers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, mothers, let's go down. Come on down, don't you want to go down? Come on, mothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Lord that he shows us the way. Thank the Lord that he blesses us and keeps us Amen. under his wing. Amen. Thank the Lord that we're sheltered by the everlasting arms that we lean upon. So we just thank the Lord this day. Let's just bow our heads and pray. We're going to sing come and drink. Take of that water of life. Amen. But first we're going to pray out in Jesus name. And thank you Lord for all that you are to us. Father we thank you for the sounding of your voice. Yes. Your voice is so very powerful. It's upon the waters. Hallelujah. It speaks powerfully. It speaks with majesty. Thank you, Father. Lord. And it will accomplish that which you've set it out to do. So, Father, even as we thank you for the sounding of your voice, we thank you for all your benefits, Father, for this day you've given us to worship you and this day that you've given us to walk in the light of your word. Father, we're thankful for all these things, Lord, and just bless this service to each and every one. Father, and may there be healing in your wings, Father, for each and every one that we've uh, requested prayer for. We just thank you, dear Lord, for the coming along in Jesus' name. Father, one step further, getting closer to the kingdom of God yes, every Lord. day. Father, we thank you for the blessed light that comes from above in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. amen. Well, amen. Come and take the water of life. Come and drink of the water of life freely given. It's the source of our power, miracle power. You must do something yourself, and the Spirit will quicken. 
Quicken the word that lives in your heart. If the Spirit abides in you, you're not in the flesh. For they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But if you act in the Spirit, move in His boldness by speaking His word, you'll receive His faith. Come and drink of the water of life freely given. It's the source of our power, miracle power. You must do something yourself, and the Spirit will quicken, quicken the word that lives in your heart. If the Spirit abides in you, you're not in the flesh, for they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But if you act in the Spirit, Move in his boldness by speaking his word, you'll receive his faith. Thank you, Lord. Well, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for received faith Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a gift of God. Thank the Lord that we can just take it unto us. Let's sing, shall we? He's the mighty one. Oh, thank the Lord for his power. He's the mighty one of Israel. Thank you, Jesus. He's the mighty one of Israel. He's the mighty one of Israel. His voice shall be heard in the power of his word. The mighty one of Israel. He's the mighty one of Israel. He's the mighty one of Israel. His voice shall be heard in the power of His word, the mighty one of Israel. The Lord shall cause His glorious voice to be seen, and you shall have a song in the night. Come to the mountain of the Lord, see His glory and His might. He's the mighty one of Israel. He's the mighty one of Israel. His voice shall be heard in the power of his word. The mighty one of Israel. Well, the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard. And you shall have a song in the night. Come to the mountain of the Lord, see his glory and his might. He's the mighty one of Israel. He's the mighty one of Israel. His voice shall be heard in the power of his word, the mighty one of Israel. The eyes of the blind shall be opened to see. The ears of the deaf shall hear. The lame man shall walk and shall leap as the heart. The tongue of the dumb shall sing. He's the mighty one of Israel. He's the mighty one of Israel. His voice shall be heard in the power of His word, the mighty one of Israel. The Lord shall cause His glorious beauty to be seen, the desert shall bloom and rejoice. Sing to them that are fearful of heart, be strong and listen to His voice. He's the mighty one of Israel. He's the mighty one of Israel. His voice shall be heard in the power of his word. The mighty one of Israel. Well, the Lord shall cause his glorious spirit to be heard. And you shall have a song in the night. Come to the mountain of the Lord, see his glory and his might. He's the mighty one of Israel. 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 He's the mighty one of
mighty one of Israel. He's the mighty one of Israel. His voice shall be heard in the power of his word. The mighty one of Israel. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord. I will sing to him a new song. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord. I will sing to him a new song. I will praise him. I will sing to him a new song. I will praise him. I will sing to him a new song. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, I will sing to him a new song. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, I will sing to him a new song. I will praise him, I will sing to him a new song. I will praise him, I will sing to him a new song. Hallelujah, 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 we about covered it <laughs> in that song amen as the blood of jesus covers us amen thank amen. the lord for a song that just brings forth the righteousness and holiness of the lord what a amen. great thing that is to us amen Bless we're blessed the thereby amen we're going to turn the service over to brother bill as we just thank the lord for his precious heaven sent word some of those songs you know you think of the psalms we sing out of i think uh -oh. the sons of asaph Amen. There in the Bible, they'd love to hear our songs. Amen. <laughs> One day we'll sing for them up on high. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank yeah. the Lord. Amen. Brother Bill. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. God bless Brother Ryan. God bless everyone this evening. And we'll get right into the first selection, which is Ain't No Grave. What's a grave anyway? Hallelujah. No. Ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. Ain't no grave. Down. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna get up out of that ground. There ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. Meet 
me, meet me, Jesus. Meet me in the middle of the air. I'm going to rise to meet my Lord and say goodbye down here. Well, look way over yonder. What do you think I see? I see a band of angels, Lord, and they're coming after me. Ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. Ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. Down. I'm gonna get up out of that ground. Ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. When Jesus comes down from heaven, put his foot on the land and see. The coming of the Lord, draw at night, he's coming for you and me. Well, I'm going down to the river, bend my knees down in the sand. I'm going to holler, hi, Hosanna, till I reach that promised land. Ain't no grave, ain't no grave, gonna hold my body down. If you take me off to the graveyard, you can lay this body down. But on that first resurrection morning, I'll be covered up out of the ground. Well, meet me, meet me, Jesus. Meet me in the middle of the air. I'm going to rise to meet my Lord. I'm going to say goodbye down here. Ain't no grave. Ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. Oh, there ain't no grave. Ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna get up out. I'm going to get up out of that ground. Ain't no grave. Ain't no grave. Ain't no grave. Going to hold my body down. There ain't no grave. Ain't no grave. Going to hold my body down. Death, where's thy sting? O grave, where's thy victory? Amen.
God bless you, brothers, Orville and sisters. For our next selection, Sister Patty and Sister Margo will sing The Days of Judgment. Scarlet beast doth now appear. Names of blasphemy are now made clear. A strong angel in the air doth fly. Men of earth repent. This is cry for the days of judgment have begun. And men will face the living God. Yes, each one. Men with hearts full of woe, evil spirits ascend from below. From the pit locusts soon to appear, to teach men of earth one God to fear. The vials of wrath now are poured. Stings of death by the demon horde. Two witnesses now shut the sky. Three and a half years, judgment they prophesy. Oh, men seek death but cannot die. They with pain do gnash their teeth and cry. Men heard words of peace that all is well. But now you are ruled by angels of hell for the days of judgment have begun and men will face the living god yes each one men with hearts full of woe evil spirits ascend from below from the pit locusts soon to appear to teach men of earth one God to fear. The beast image to men now doth talk. Fire from its mouth will burn you if you mock. From the sea the beast is risen, holding men's souls in a tradition prison. In heaven, saints and angels await. For many on earth, it is now too late. Water now is turned to blood. On earth, the judgment of fire and flood. For the days of judgment have begun. And men will face the living God, yes, each one. Men with hearts full of woe, evil spirits ascend from below. From the pit locusts soon to appear, to teach men of earth one God to fear. Strange miracles now men see. But your souls cannot go free. Fire comes down from the sky. Man of earth, you have believed a lie. The book of Revelation, yes, it's true. For the Gentile and for the Jew. The Lord of lords, the King of kings. They see his coming and hear his angels' wings. What name has this Lord and King? Who on earth does judgment bring? He is called the Word of God or Lamb. In days of old, the great I Am. The one John saw whose word 
words he did write, Jesus Christ the Lord, God of life. Amen. God bless you, Sister Patty and Sister Margo. For next selection, Sister Miriam, Brother Oval, and myself, we will sing, He Shall Reign. ye heavenly gates for the coming of the King of glory. All the angels sing their song and declare your mighty works before you. It's a song of victory. It's redemption, glorious power, victory over sin and death, and salvation for your sons and daughters. See the Lamb who once was slain, is alive and rules forever after. See the scars that for all time are a witness to the wounds that healed us. Is this not the one who died, risen from the tomb and lives, seated at the Father's side? There to reign over every generation. Oh, you shall reign forevermore. Oh, you shall reign forevermore. is alive and rules for every after. See the scars that for all time are a witness to the wounds that healed us. Is this not the one who died? Risen from the womb and lives, seated at the Father's side, there to reign for every generation. Oh, you shall reign for. For the coming of the King of glory All the angels sing their song And declare your mighty works before you It's a song of victory It's 
redemption's glorious power, victory over sin and death, and salvation for your sons and daughters, and you shall reign forever. God does reign in Amen. Jesus' name. For our last selections, we will sing, Let's Do God's Will and When He Comes. Those that are predestined 
will hear the Spirit call. They'll put down fleshly creeds of man and listen to God's plan. Listen, Margaret, dear brethren, are you ready to meet the Lord? The dead marriage supper up in glory land. Thank you, Lord. Let's do God's will, His His perfect perfect will, and stand upon His word and have the revelation. Perfect harmony before his blessed face, knowing he has brought us into this perfect place. When he comes in glory, yes, splendor. When he comes to gather his own, when he comes, we shall be like him. When he comes, we're going. place of rest, a perfect peace, and happy reunions, illuminated by the source of uncreated light. No temple is needed there, and no veil will separate us. We'll be face to face with the one who made our bodies glorified. When he comes in glory, yes, splendor. When he comes to gather his own. We shall be like him When he comes We're going home As King of kings And Lord of lords He will return His face will shine just like the sun, his clothes white as light. If I'm alive, I will be changed in that moment in time. But if my time has come and gone, we will meet in the sky when he comes in glory a splendor when he comes to gather his own when he comes we shall be like him In glory, a splendor. When he comes to gather his own. When he comes, we shall be like him. When he 
comes, we're going home. When He comes. Thank the Lord. Well, Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. And if we'll all stand before Pastor Ryan comes to bring forth the word of truth unto us, we will sing grace, grace, God's grace. God's Thank grace you. is sufficient for me. Thank Let's bow our heads and pray, shall we? Thank the Lord, Sister Miriam, plays through. Father, we just thank you for your grace. Father, your free will mercy that's given to us. You, As a gift, if, Lord, let it be freely received, yeah. that which, which you have given to us so liberally. Father, we thank you for it. And we thank you, Father, for the promise that we make our way toward, Father. Thank you, As we thank the Lord that we can be in your will, your perfect will. And be gathered unto that perfect place, Father, in the kingdom which is to come. So, Father, just shed your light round about us this night. Lord, bless us even as you have done, yes, Lord. Lord. We thank you for your word and for your grace, thank Father, you, the vision of your life that comes to us through the name and faith of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. In that blessed name we do pray, amen, amen. and amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, glory to God. Lord, for all those gathered, you may be seated. Thank the Lord that he is our strength evermore as we speak on the things of the Lord and thank the Lord for that light which we have. We're thankful for our daily bread, whether of the physical kind or certainly the spiritual. We thank the Lord as man does not live by physical bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Almighty God. So uh, we thank the Lord. I just want to turn in Scripture right off the bat to Psalms chapter 8. Psalms chapter 8, as we come to the finishing touches of this expounding on the prophetic testimony of Jesus, 
We thank the Lord that he's given us a voice to hear. He's given us a name to know. He's given us a pathway to follow. He's given us a word to read. He's given us a word to hold up as the sword of his spirit. You know, and, it, and I was just thinking on things this afternoon. Uh, you know, I spoke a little to the fact that, you know, the, the James Webb telescopes taking pictures. And, of course, we've been looking at Hubble pictures. Now we're getting even better pictures from the glory of, of what God has done. You know, and, and in thinking of that, and, of course, this has been a preparation lesson to hear the uh, seven thunders sounding. And this would be part six uh, as we number them. And, and the, the last service for now under this title but uh, uh, thinking of the preparation of the Lord and how he's prepared us. So I wanted to read here at Psalms chapter 8. And we'll read verses 3 and 4. You know what I was thinking? Here it is. God prepared us even for what the Webb telescope's going to show us. When we look out and see the wonder of what God has done, yeah. and the world misinterprets it, you know, they look at it as if we're just to look at the vast reaches of space and the trillions of galaxies that are out there and how it makes us so insignificant we're just one tiny dot on the swirling arms of the milky way galaxy boy are they ever wrong god has placed us right in the center of his will and look at what he has done in the creation that surrounds us so that we could see his light through the stars above through the day star and the daytime that's what god has done and as for the rest of it what god holds in in store for it uh, he knows, but it'll be glorious, I can tell you that. Uh, this galaxy, uh, at least, uh, or our solar system, you know, the scripture tells us we won't have need of sun or moon. I don't know about the rest of it, but whatever is there will be to the glory of God and what a mighty work he has done. It's just, it's vast and it's glorious and it's beautiful. And it all praises God's holy name, every bit of it. Whatever picture the Webb telescope brings us next, the only thing it's ever going to show you is how glorious God's Word is. And he prepares us for even that because at Psalms chapter 8 and verse 3, David says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful from him, of him? And the son of man that thou visitest, him. And Jesus, of course, would visit us in a body of flesh as the word became flesh to dwell among us. You know, so God even prepared us for what we were going to see in the centuries to come in the glory of the universe, the Psalms 19 witness in the sky above us. God's even prepared us for that. And along with the gift of life, that's a lot to take in. It's a lot to be grateful for. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Well, as a matter of fact, it, it's a good spiritual question. Answer to that question is we're in the center of his will. So he was mindful of us. As a matter of fact, everything that's out there was made for us. And I'm on a one-man crusade to say everybody out there in the news media, they've got that all wrong. It doesn't make us insignificant. It makes us the most significant thing that there is. We're right in the center of his will. Amen. And see the glory of God. The universe isn't anything without life in it. It has to have life, and here we are. We live, we move in his being, and uh, thank the Lord, he is mindful for us. When Jesus came in a body of flesh, who'd he come to? He didn't come to the galaxies out there. He came right here. Came right here where the water is, where the air is to breathe. Right here on planet Earth, amen. Brought the gift of life with him. And that's a lot to take in, but I, I understand as a member of the human race, you know, and I've asked this question, you know, what, why are you mindful of us? Or, or in other words, why in the world do you even put up with us? Because there's so much sin and hardness of heart in the world. There's so many things that, including the heathen raging and imagining vain things, that but Jesus, what did he say upon the cross? He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He stayed there. Stayed there right on the cross. The Roman nails didn't hold him. Love held him there. Amen. Because he was mindful of us. And it's all victory. Amen. That God gives us a place in him out of his love and out of his mercy. And that's why this book is the greatest story that's ever told. 
It's all victory. It's all the defeating of the enemy and the accuser of the brethren. It's all set in place to give us a hope for the future and the putting down of the dark domain. And Christ has answers. And has a, he has a plan put into scriptures foreseen from the beginning by he who knows no boundaries of time or, or any dimension, length, width, height, dimension of time. And it's an awesome spectacle of glory, what's contained out there in the universe. And these sayings that are known and lead to even greater things. It leads to things that are the secrets of Almighty God, and they are revealed to us through the sounding of his thunders. So seven thunders sounding, and this would be the sixth part, as the word of truth is what God cares about. And you know what? So should we. We should care about that greatly. It's how we get to the glory revealed, by living in that which has no beginning and which has no ending. Some truths have no beginning. They were always true, such as the concept and precept of love. Nobody invented it. It was always there. It's an eternal thought. Uh, God used math, amen. He put the world together and framed the universe. It's there in Job chapter 38. He held the measuring line in his hands and he used math and numbers are sacred to him. That's why we pay attention to them in scripture. As a, for instance, the pattern of seven, which shows in seven days of creation, shows in seven thundering voices of Psalms 29, which we'll go over in this service. And uh, it shows in the vials and the trumpets and the seals and the thunders and all those things. God uses mathematics because that's the wisdom of God that ever was. If you ask this question, when did one plus one become two? And you think about when was the first day? Who invented that? Well, nobody invented it. It was always there. It's an eternal concept. So there are things that are eternal. You cannot get back to a time. I mean, we invent words to describe these mathematical characteristics, sure. But the precept was always there, waiting to be discovered. So there are truths that are eternal. You can't, like love and mercy and faith and wisdom, you can't get back to a time when these things were not. They are eternal. And that there is an eternal personage to all those attributes. Well, I give you the creation of God. I give you the heavens. I give you the stars above. I give you the fact that we're right here right now, living and breathing. I give you the witness of prophetic scripture that brings itself to pass. So eternity has brought itself to pass in Christ. Amen. Those are truths that don't have a beginning. They have no end. You can't get rid of it. You can't kill the precept of love. You can't kill wisdom that's eternal. It always was. It always will be. It dwells outside the boundaries of time because love has no start. It's always there, waiting for souls to seek unto it, wisdom too. And since God is love, and since God is wisdom, and since God is the self-existent I am of Scripture, who is constantly abiding, well, then love has to be of eternal stuff too. For God is those things. And eternal wisdom, that makes us always to look forward. Pro prophetically, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, and here we'll see how it is that God prepares his seed by the double witness doctrine that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. Amen. I uh, paraphrased it uh, earlier in, this, in these sermons, but we'll read it directly now. Matthew chapter 18, and uh, it was at the end of uh, part one, I believe, of, of these particular sermons, but we've mentioned it and spoke to it many times over the course of many years, both myself and uh, Brother Jack and those that uh, have uh, spoken from the pulpit or in Sunday school lessons and so forth. All right, so Matthew chapter 18, and, and following that, the bulk of this service will center around Psalms chapter 29. And uh, we read it in part one, but we'll speak just a little more to it uh, this evening as a foundation for the fact that seven thunders, they will sound. As shown to the 
apostle, prophet, revelator, John upon the Isle of Patmos, while he was imprisoned. Oh, John in prison, that's a laugh. He was the freest man on the face of the earth. They thought they had him in prison there. He was in prison because of his testimony. He had the witness of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He had Old New Testament. He had them put together, and he was the freest man on the planet. And that vision showed itself to him, and that's, that made his spirit free. So uh, thank the Lord for the freedom that comes in the, with the spirit of God. And to, and to look at these things out of Psalms 29 again, those are for foundational purposes only. Just like the Ten Commandments are foundational for the, uh, the law in the prophets. Everything is based on those. And then the two great commandments are the basis for the Ten Commandments to exist. So all things are founded upon those things. So as we come to them, we'll read first from Matthew chapter 18. And again, just to underscore, I have to be careful with the subject matter. I don't have any special knowledge of the content or timing of the voice of God that utters forth as according to Revelation 10.3, but the word of God is always special. And there are some things that we can point out in order to stimulate spiritual thought and then just rest in it and let let God be made true and let every man be a liar. But we're reaching forth to God's truth. I do have what is written, and that's what makes all things true. All right? Now, just, just before we get to Matthew 18, This next mention, I'm not going to look up these scriptures today or add another part uh, to the lesson uh, for this reason. I want to avoid any misunderstanding. If I put them into service, it might convey the impression that I think it's an absolute and I'm not making that assertion. Uh, But I will make an observational point as to the timing of God's thundering voice. When the lion of the tribe of Judah roars and who will not fear when that voice roars so uh, it it may be this way uh, uh, it may not I say it just to stimulate thought to prepare and realize that there is a voice coming within the book of Revelation then there are seven identifiable actions as actions taken upon the earth have great impact on the earth excuse me from the enemy who is described as the great red dragon. Now great, that doesn't mean in any sense of holiness. But, ha- but he has power for a time and a times and a half a time. Space of three and a half years. And when you read that out of scripture, it looks very mysterious. The King James uh, translators, they were careful to avoid mistakes, so they didn't want to get the time sequence wrong. So they described it in general terms, time and times and half a time. Uh, Many modern translations just simply say three and a half years, and that is indeed the intent of it. So it's not necessarily a great matter of revelation. It's more a matter of translation. Time, times, and half a time are the space of three and a half years. But those places that are identifiable actions that come under the heading of the great red dragon, the enemy that looks to kill off the seed of the Almighty God. Those places are in Revelation 12, 4 and 5, his tail drawing the third part of the stars in order to devour the child. Now that's, that's real rebellion. That there are many philosophical rebellions that go on in debates, but that's, that's firing a shot that starts a war. All right, so the red dragon's there to devour the child in Revelation 12, 4 and 5. Second point is Revelation 12, 13. Persecution under the heading of the great red dragon. Persecution of the woman that gave birth to the man-child. Revelation 12, 15, that'd be third, the dragon or serpent cast a flood after the woman. Revelation 12, 17, dragon makes war on the remainder of the seed of the woman. Tries to kill the man-child, tries to persecute the woman, then the remainder of her seed, failing at all that. And then Revelation 16, 13, which is a three-part action for a total of seven, a three-pronged attack by description of three unclean, 
frogs, symbolically speaking, of course, out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Those are direct moves against God and his people. So, do those have meaning in the timing of Almighty God? It may be. Uh, you know, I'm just putting it out there to stimulate thought and to say that I'm aware of those things and that I wonder. But I'm not going to read them up, uh, read them all at, at this point. I'd have to have uh, more evidence of s Scripture. But those are seven points where they might directly correlate to the sounding of God's voice. God knows. I don't. But that's uh, written in Scripture, and those are direct moves. Of, of that, there's no debate about. They're direct moves against God and his people. There are other red dragon references there that don't belong in that same exact category, such as Revelation 13, verse 2 and verse 4. Uh, those are descriptions more than direct attacks. So, will this be when God speaks with a thundering voice, when those things take place? I wonder. I wonder greatly about that. Again, that's for the Lord to verify. That's for him to know. But it's for us to think about and uh, consider God's word. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24? He said, look for the signs. Look for the signs of the times. So that's, that's all it is. But God has to verify everything. And uh, if he verifies that by thunder, well, so be it. But the word of the Lord, it will come forth. All right, here in Matthew chapter 18 now, God will make all things known. Your best defense at any hour, and especially in the timeline of prophecy, it's twofold, and it's very simple. It's the best way to beat deception. It's the best way to beat the rudiments of this world. It's the best way to defeat the power of the enemy, and it's very simple. It's Mark chapter 12, verse 29, 30, and accordingly, verse 31. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Love him with all your heart and soul and everything that's within, and love his people accordingly. On those two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. Every other point of doctrine that we ever preach, it's built upon those two precepts. And they're very simple and they're very straightforward and they lift us up. And if you do that, if you think like that, and you've got that in your heart, then you'll never have the mark of the beast and you'll never worship his image of all that he projects. You won't think like Antichrist. You won't do what he does. And I don't care if they strap you down to the gurney and tattooed three sixes on your forehead. If you don't do like Antichrist and if you don't think like he does and you don't do what he wants you to do, you don't have the mark of the beast. Amen. You're free within your spirit. Amen. So thank the Lord for his holy word. All right. So where God's voice needs to be heard, it will be heard. And when intervention is needed the most, and certainly we need God's voice that I, to intervene in those places of which I just read out of Revelation, uh, referring to them, out of Revelation 12 for the most part and Revelation 16, uh, God's voice will be needed. It's up for God to decide these things. All right, here in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, because this is given in context of those things that set us apart from one another. More if thy, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Do it on a personal basis. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Keep the peace. You know, do the best you can. And uh, those things which you must address, do it after this manner. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And uh, that which is written about uh, two or three witnesses, every word being established, that, uh, the Old Testament foundations found in the book of Numbers in uh, chapter 35 and verse 30, which is Jesus is referring to here. But the point is always to gain your brother given in that context. That's what we're trying to do here by following God's holy will. As God gains his brethren from his witness through scripture. And it's written all throughout. So given here, it's given directly in context to settle disputes among brethren. 
but it's also a picture of how God administers his word because there's such a unity, there's such a balance between the comparing scriptures to scriptures. It keeps us centered upon his word, which is a line upon line precept of Isaiah 28, verse 10. The here and uh, a little, there a little precept by comparison. As God verifies truth by many scriptures, so that they are justified each by one another in order to establish his will. Uh, this done to avoid misunderstandings, mistranslations, word of God's put into many different languages, but it's meant to be translated in those languages plainly. The New Testament was a translation because it was written in Greek, which Jesus did not speak as a, as a primary language. They spoke in Aramaic and, and Hebrew. So plainly, the word of God was meant to be translated so people could read it in their own languages. And built within the scripture is the double witness doctrine in order to guard against failures of a person who is doing the translating. If he doesn't translate it as good as uh, it could be done, well, there's other scriptures to help us understand uh, scripture number one. So it, it's a method of checks and balances that's written into the word of God so he can put us in the right place at the right time at the right moment and be centered upon his will. And uh, the scripture I invariably use to illustrate that is Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 24. There's a common saying that he that spares the rod spoils the child in the King James Version just quoted, it's spare the rod, you hate the child or hate him. But that same gospel also that says that love takes chastening and the rod, the rod, you know, it doesn't mean you have to carry a big wooden stick around you and whack them every time there's something you don't like. That's a fleshly interpretation of that scripture. Uh, the shepherd's staff is meant to guide, not punish. That's what it's for. The rod of correction, it's symbolic of strong guidance because Jesus also said this he said whosoever offends one of these little ones harms their faith or or their person it's better for them to have a millstone hung around their neck and be cast into the middle of the sea so when you put those two things together you get centered on God's will and understand the mindset of what the scriptures are intended to deliver. So you have to be careful. You can't isolate any sacred line. That the word of God is meant to be read as one work, as it testifies one another. That none of these scriptures will lack its spiritual mate. So from verse to verse, just let them speak. Let them do what they were written to do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Psalms 29. Psalms 29 is such a place. It's written to compare line upon line and just let the scriptures speak verse to verse as they are foundational, that much I can say. You know why I can say they're foundational to seven thunders? How can I be so assured about that? Because they are written. That's how I know that. That's how I know that. Because they're written. They're put into the gospel. God's voice is is there and it is written. Amen. There's seven thundering voices of God and they're not written into scripture just to be ignored or put past so that we can get to the prosperity gospel which is so prevalent in our day and age where gain is supposed to be godliness where it should be godliness with contentment is great gain or just preaching social issues or political issues that our focus is upon the Word of God. We've got greater things. Amen. You can take interests in different areas, but our focus here is on the Word of God. Amen. So these things are here to be noticed, and it's all to prepare. Prepare to meet thy God. It's meant to do that. So we have read them once in part one, but we'll go over them again, just speak a, a little more uh, to their depth. As it starts out at Psalms 29, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Does worship matter? Does praise matter? Does making a joyful noise unto the Lord, does that matter? Uh, it matters greatly. It's written here. 
This is what we do. And there are times to be still that know and know that I am God. And you'll, you'll come to those places. You'll know them. But the, this is a time to praise, amen, to give him the glory for the beauty of his holiness. And who are the mighty? The, the mighty are those that abide in truth. And when, they ab- when you abide in truth, you're into the mightiness of the power of God, whether of men and angels, or angels rather, uh, in heaven or on earth. But the scriptures were meant especially for us and human creation. Angels desire to look into them. They desire to look into the things that are written. But the Bible was sent to our creation, Adam's race, was sent to humanity. So it applies directly to us. Angels have their glorious place, that creation, spiritual creation, beings of light, they have their place, we have ours. We're all fellow servants together. As uh, Revelation chapter 19, verse 10 uh, speaks to that as we read it this morning. All right, so the point of all these things is to praise by worship, because that's your communication lines. We are in a battle. What's any enemy try to do in any battle, any war that you've ever read about in the annals of history or the things that are going right no- on right now on the earth, they try to cut off your lines of communication. So the devil wants to get into your worship and cut off your lines of communication. So we have to keep the prayer channel open. As God set worship in place to give us a place to find him, a way to reach him, a chance to know him, a chance to be known of him. And it's always been about the worship. It's been that from the beginning. It's about, it was about the worship in the angelic creation. It's about the worship in the story of Cain and Abel. When Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's offering was rejected. And we're here to, and we're meant to hear the voice and glorify the spirit of truth that God is. And this is that time that we have. God's given us this time to develop our spirits and to acknowledge him as Lord and Christ before we, before we fly away. I love singing that song, amen, when the brothers and sisters were here from the tabernacles. I'll fly away, oh glory, amen. What a thought, what a vision that is. So we call unto him in verses 1 and 2, and he shows us great and mighty things as the blessing comes back to us in a perfect circle of faith. As it comes back to us, we'll read 10 and 11 at, uh, as we finish Psalms 29. But the, that's where the Lord gives strength. So all that praise and whatever you put into this gospel, it comes back around and it blesses you mightily in Jesus' name. It gives us strength and peace of verse 11. And so what does any enemy do? They try to cut off your communication. What's the devil want to do in particular? He wants to cut off your worship and make it so your worship is not of none effect, which is why Jesus warned against the traditions and being repetitive and vain worship, because all that does is serve to cut off uh, the spirit of the Lord with your life. So he wants to cut off your worship, and he wants to do this. He wants to show himself as God upon the mount of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He wants to do that. So we need a voice that delivers strength and peace, all we need it mightily. Amidst the storm of events that's coming, we need God's voice. But remember this, and I alluded to it many times, but earlier today, the devil, he's cast down into a much lower place, and that's all he can aspire to. And you know, you have to be careful how you say things because Uh, Jude verse 9 says that Michael didn't, he didn't even bring any railing accusation against the devil uh, when contending about the body of Moses. So you have to be careful. But I'll use this description. The devil wanting to sit on the, the mount of God showing himself as God, he's been cast down. And that whole business, what it really is, is pathetic. It's pathetic. He wanted to be upon the mountain of God. He has been upon the mountain of God. He's walked up and down in the stones of fire. He said, I'll sit on the mountain of God and I'll be like the Most High Himself. Sit on the very throne of God. Now all he can do is, being cast down to earth, is sit up on the mountain where Abraham took Isaac up, where the Jerusalem temple was. 
That's the best he can do. It's, he's a loser. It's pathetic. So, the, so yeah, it's a high point of uh, things upon earth. That, that's true. It's the culmination of all things prophetic. But the devil is a defeated enemy. And he's cast down low. And he has great wrath about that in a short time. So always remember that you're fighting, and the fight is very real. And it, it, the fight is so real, as a matter of fact, it takes seven voices of God to bring deliverance. But the enemy is cast down. He's already been defeated. Amen. He wanted to be above the heights in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. But now he's cast down. So his desire to be like the Most High has been shown for what it is. It's his own delusion to believe a lie. When people start lying and they believe their own delusions, uh, th that's what the devil did. He fell for his own lies. I'll be like the Most High. Now he's cast down. So, but amidst all of that, this voice of Psalms 29, it must be heard above the din, and the voice of Revelation 10:3, above the noise and confusion of battle. And that's why that voice thunders. All right, to the third verse, as we pay strict attention to the voice that will shake the earth. Shake heaven and earth, and that, that's what we're doing here. So as we come to the content of the verses again, uh, thank the Lord that God speaks. It's written. There are some intriguing details here. It's up for the Lord to decide the truth of them, but we can take note of them and pray for God to reveal as according to his will. It's his will be done, not mine. But at verse 3, the first voice sounds, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. Oh, that just rolls off the tongue. I could read that scripture all, all night long. Amen. Thank the Lord. This being the first voice of thunder, judgments coming to the woman who sits upon many waters in Revelation chapter 17, verse 1, uh, described in such unsavory terms as she is because she's a, a sellout and has sold out her soul for money and popularity and power of this world sold out to all those things. But even amidst all that, what can we be glad for? We can be glad that the voice of God yeah. speaks. Hallelujah. We know that. The voice of God will speak. I can say that with all certainty. For it is written, and in, the, in general terms, we can draw a few conclusions as to the details of the, and the specifics of what this first thunder says. And it doesn't have to necessarily correlate uh, number by number with the seven thunders of the book of Revelation. That's up for God to decide the order of things. But the detail here, it's so secret that of the voice of God that brings about the second coming, remember Jesus said of that hour, no one knows, just my Father only. And of course, John was not allowed to write about the content of what the Spirit revealed to him in Revelation 10.4. So we have to keep all these things in mind. All right? So, the devil has a secret plan, but God does too. Great red dragon, he's going to take specific actions that are outlined in Scripture. The timing of God's thundering voice. Uh, those may be points where those things have to thunder forth. God, God knows. But these things are very real. And they're matters to be decided in the prophetic future that the book of Revelation speaks about. And as to what we can say in this scripture, in prophetic symbology, waters often represent the populace of the earth, the sea of humanity that encircles the globe. And uh, so you can see, we won't look it up directly, but Revelation 17, verse 15 especially, is a key scripture to understand the interpretation of what the waters are. Now waters in, in the scripture, it'll depend on the context. Uh, waters can mean just the, like the waters of, that are eternal, the living waters that was spoken of to the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. Uh, but in this case, I believe we can say the voice of thunder will have worldwide implications. Uh, it most certainly will. We can say that much. And it'll be over nations, kindreds, and tongues. 
So the water's representing nations, kindreds, and tongues, and uh, there could certainly be more to it than what I know. But I think I can save that, I can say at least that much safely. There can be more to it than what I understand at this moment. That's up for the Lord to reveal. That's his decision, that's his timing, that's his will. But that is one voice of thunder. And then the next two voices of thunder are contained within the fourth verse. And for the foundational reasons that we've spoken of, we'll read these. As these Psalms, they're prophetic. They hold the life of Christ within them. You can write a biography out of the Psalms and out of the wisdom of the Old Testament concerning the life of Christ, but they're the basis for prophetic knowledge as well, along with the law of prophets. And double witness doctrine established those principles too. Uh, so does a parable of the house built upon a rock. You have to have foundations. So all these things are founded in the word of God. Thank the Lord that God puts us on the rock of revelation. Yeah. I waited patiently for the Lord, and it takes some patience. Psalms chapter 40 and verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined and heard my cry. So the, so the answer's on the way. What we don't know, we will know when we need to know it, according to God's will and his revelation of which the powers of hell can never prevail against. So Psalms 29.4 Two thunders within the scripture, the second and third by orders. We read the first one in verse 3. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Two voices that thunder here. And the second of the three so far has its emphasis on the word power. And then the third voice has its emphasis upon the word majesty. Now, in scripture, this, this is where you can read the whole Bible and talk about seven thunders. How many scriptures are there in the Bible that speak of God's power and his majesty, where there are multitude? There are multitudes of them, so you could go and go uh, on that one. And all of them prepare for his voice written. And are there secrets that we don't know about in those power scriptures and then those uh, scriptures that speak to his royalness and his majesty, well, that certainly could be. I don't know them. God does. If, if it's written that way, blessed be the name of the Lord. It's certainly a, a possibility. But the foundations are here. And everything said is to prepare the way. And this tells us that his voice is power, of which there are hundreds. I actually Googled that. How many power scriptures are there within scripture. There's approximately in the neighborhood of 275. But uh, their strength would be the same thing as power, you know. So it's just, it's in other synonyms. It, it just, it's just onward and, and on it goes. And within those things can be th uh, what God has to reveal about his sounding voice. But again, that's, that's up to the Lord. All right, but this tells us that his voice is in power and it is not limited as to what it can do. Remember what is written in the book of Acts, they tarried until Pentecost, until power from on high, and it endued them there. Well, and power is written many times in the book of Revelation. It all speaks to us. It all speaks to the wisdom and glory of the Almighty God, and place no limits upon what the word of the Lord can reveal Amen. to us. Amen. Place no limits on the Holy One of Israel. Give him the glory that verses 1 and 2 say that is due him. And there has to be a people who are ready to move at the sounding of God's voice in real time as he speaks. And that voice is going to help us to move. So there's no uncertain sound. So we understand these things. So thank God for the power. There's going to be power in that voice. But always recall this to mind. When the disciples came together to Jesus, remember this example, and uh, they were uh, rejoicing of the power even over unclean spirits. But and Jesus said, I beheld Satan as falling from, uh, from heaven as lightning. Well, thank the Lord for the victory of that. But he said, rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So when, in any time, amen, we thank the Lord for this power. But remember that your names are written in heaven. That's always the chief joy. 
God will speak in power when he does. What's your response? To be glad that you have a name written in heaven. His voice will be done. His will will make itself known. Be glad to have a name in the Lamb's book of life. And from majesty, from my majesty scriptures, there are a multitude of them in the book of Revelation. From Isaiah chapter 6, we find that the prophet was in awe of the majesty of God, of the Lord, who was high and lifted up and the train of his royal garments that filled the temple of his, his holiness. He said, woe is me, I'm undone, I've seen the king. A showing of majesty there. Now, can you imagine what this would do if you got a vision like Isaiah got and you saw the glory of his majesty? Can you, can you imagine what that is? Just take a moment and think about that. I'll let you do it. <laughs> Amen. Think about what that would do to your spirit. What would a vision of Isaiah's six type and seeing the majesty of the Lord lifted up on high, being attended to by angels, what would that do to your inner being? So don't underestimate, you know, it just looks simple on the page, but don't underestimate what the seeing of the majesty of the Lord would do. Now it's up for the Lord to do these things, but there's power in his majesty. Amen. So, And we're being prepared in heart and mind for these things. In Isaiah's case, it prepared him for a call off the altar. Once he saw the majesty of the Lord, that got him in a place where God could touch him on the lips with a coal from the fire of the very altar itself. Because it purges iniquity. And what's the only thing that purges iniquity? That's the life of Christ. That's the only thing. That's the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. He got a little foretaste of it, symbolically through the coal of fire off the altar in Isaiah 6. But that's the life of Christ himself. That's the word of the Lord from on high that came forth and purged him. So what can majesty do? Amen. It can get you ready to say, Lord, here am I. Whereas before, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. God will get you ready. His power will do that. The seeing of his majesty will do that. God's word, it changes things. Even as the word proclaimed ever stays the same. And even though we're speaking in broader context here and in generalities, uh, but we're doing so because I believe the people who will hear the voice of the Lord are the ones who are prepared for it. Like the wise virgins of Matthew 25 that know there is a subject like that that are prepared in their heart and their mind, their body and their soul to receive these things. All right. Then we come to the fourth voice, which is in verse 5, and it continues into verse 6, which says, The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. That's the fourth, fourth voice of thunder overall. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. And in part one, I made brief reference to that. Unicorn, the English language has changed a lot in four centuries. It's just a, a word that the translators use to describe a horned animal, like the calf that was uh, skipping. It makes the calf to skip. Uh, that's contained there in the first portion of verse six. So uh, God makes things to happen. He breaks the cedars of Lebanon. Amen. Uh, You'll recall to mind the cedars of Lebanon. Temple was built with the cedars of Lebanon, which is exactly where the Antichrist wants to sit. So he wants to sit on the Temple Mount showing himself that he is God. So God will break all the powers that try to project themselves as God in mockery of the Holy One and set themselves up as God himself. And it can certainly be reflective of the political powers of the earth and how they're dealt with. Within scripture and the interpretation of dreams, notably in the book of Daniel, trees symbolize powers there, or the great tree, as it was in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He was troubled by that dream in Daniel chapter 4. But the word from David to Nebuchadnezzar was an interpretation of the dream. It is thou... O king, there in Daniel 4, 22. 
The tree was Nebuchadnezzar himself and Babylon, which he said he had built by his power and his strength. And the king's madness was for, anybody remember the length of time that was? It was for seven years as the prophecy unfolded. Not unlike the madness of the heathen raging and imagining vain things for Daniel's 70th week, which is a space of seven years time period, three and a half years of those being deep tribulation, or I alluded to it earlier, the time and times and half a time, as written in Daniel 12, 7, as written in Revelation 12, 14. So three and a half years there in the middle of that week for Daniel's 70th week. So this battle, this battle that we fight, it has to be the Lord's. God has to win this victory. And uh, Lebanon, Lebanon, rather, and Syrian, uh, which is the Mount of Lebanon, that's been the staging area for many invasions and many uh, oppressions that have come throughout the years there in the north of Israel. Uh, Lebanon itself is usually just the conduit. Lebanon itself is a poor nation. It's been overrun. Right now it's dominated by the uh, Hezbollah faction and, and the Syrian uh, dictator right here at this moment. Uh, it's off, been oft overrun, but it's mentioned there within Scripture. But all powers or trees that come up against the ordained of the Lord, you know what they're going to have to hear? They're going to have to hear the voice of the Lord speak to them. God's going to speak. And the fierceness of the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God will come forth. There will be time no longer. Time's up. It's done. No longer will God allow these things to be. And it, so within this scripture, there's a power over nature itself here. And that's very much implied and in line with Matthew 24 and the signs of the times. But it's the, Lord, it's the Lord's will to prove out all matters of uh, his divine wrath and his judgments. But the power is there to do that. And so is his majesty. Which brings us then to Psalms 29 and verse 7 and the fifth voice as we count them. As the imagery of Psalms 29, it's very much storm analogy. Even as the storm of events that characterizes the end time, they're played out. And here we read it out of verse 7. As the thunders play themselves out in the fifth voice of God within this context. And there's always a call to repentance. Remember that. You know, these are seven chances also for there be some repentance. What Peter say, even in that day, the day of the darkness of the sun, six seal time, whosoever shall, be, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, the plagues that came upon Egypt, they were great judgments, but they were also ten chances for Egypt to turn aside from its pride and humble itself and to let my people go. So there's mercy in those things. There, there's judgment, all right, but God extends the mercy. He extended mercy to Judas Iscariot. He gave him warnings, turn aside from the course, as he said things, that thou doest, do quickly. Jesus, he was warning him right there. He's warning Judas to turn aside from the course he was on, but things had to play themselves out. But don't say that God doesn't extend mercy, because he most certainly does. In the day of judgment, he offers chances to turn aside. And here in Psalms 29, verse 7, the voice of the Lord, fifth vo thundering voice by number, the voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. Think of lightning there. Lightning's a swift, it's an immediate strike. It's written in flames of fire. Uh, sometimes, like in 2 Samuel 22, the word lightning does appear. There are different Hebrew phrases uh, referred to, but it, uh, lightning is what we picture in modern English, uh, the flames of fire, which is nature at its, a point that it's so powerful and it strikes so very swiftly. So what does lightning do? Well, it lights up the darkness, makes things known in that flash of light. When the darkness gathers, it strikes immediately. And uh, these are things in general terms. The specifics of it, only God 
knows. Uh, you can't, nobody's going to come up with a computer and analyze the Bible and come up with what the seven thunders are. It can't be, it, it can't be ascertained in any of that way. You can put the smartest people on the planet together in a room. They can't figure it out. The devil himself who's wiser than Daniel. Can't figure it out. Uh, but God knows. And God will reveal according to his will. All right? If, the, if it was possible to discern that, the devil would have done it long ago. But we can say this about Psalms 29. It is written. Amen. It is written. Amen. It's there. And what is written is written. And what is written is intended to bring about victory of deliverance. And, and all scriptures do that. I, each scripture, every book, they're all intended to prepare you for the coming of the Lord. They're all intended to bring deliverances. And these scriptures will do that too. And I have no doubt that the accuser of the brethren is very aware of these scriptures. We have an instance that shows us that. Psalms 91 verses 11 and 12, the devil quoted them right to Jesus. Cast thyself down, for he'll uh, give his angels charge over thee. Lift thee up and, and in case at any time you would dash your foot against a stone. So quoted in the days following the temptation, following Jesus' 40-day fast in the wilderness. So does the devil know scriptures? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And then, even as now, and on into the prophetic future, whatever the devil does or does not know, these scriptures are victory. And they're preparation for the battle to be won. And that's why I say even the thunders themselves have a foundation in Scripture. Out of these Scriptures in particular, we're focusing on Psalms 29. But all the Scriptures and more besides. All Scriptures that speak of God's power. All Scriptures that speak of God's majesty. All the Scriptures bring you to this place. They bring you to Christ upon the cross. They bring you to the sounding of His voice. And in a special, I believe Psalms 29, of course, provides that. Because God is he who provides. God provides a sacrifice. That's Jehovah Jireh, right? God will provide a sacrifice. Upon the mount of the Lord it will be seen. So God is always he who provides. And he's providing a way for us to be on the victory side. Because our God is a consuming fire. Elijah of old, he had his Mount Carmel showdown there. Brother Branham used to like to use that phrase. And there's a Mount Carmel showdown coming against the modern day priests of Jezebel as it was in Elijah's day. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to show who God really is, just as it did in the day of Elijah. And uh, the battle will be won by it in whatever manner that the Lord deems. All right. Now we're down to the eighth verse of Psalms 29 and the sixth voice as we count them. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. Six voice by number. And if it thunders, won't it rain? God will rain. Amen. He'll be the one to finish the harvest because he's Lord of the harvest. And uh, Kadesh is the fourth voice. Covered the northern regions, Lebanon and Syria. And this verse is the south country of Israel. Uh, at least to this, I can say that God will cover all points, Amen. north, south, east, and west. Amen. Just like a, the rock hitting the water analogy, where do the ripples go? They go all directions. The voice of thunder will do just that. It'll accomplish whatever it needs to do. If it's needed to drive the Philistines off the mount, like it was in the days of Samuel the prophet when the Lord thundered upon the Philistines, if the thunders that has to be that literal, that's exactly what it's going to do. It'll thunder him right off the mount. That's up to the Lord of hosts. He knows. But God will cover all points, whether politically or geographically or spiritually or dimensionally in, in whatever manner, the infinite God will get the work done. But since we see the place name, we take notice of that. It may have special significance in the stages of the conflict which are, are to come, of which there are many in Matthew 24. The signs of the times are in there. We went over uh, just in brief about how Jesus spoke to the seals that are in Matthew 24. And they're also contained in there are elements 
of the vials of wrath and, and the trumpets also. So, but in this region, Kadesh, this is a place where the tribes of Israel wandered under Moses. Abraham fought battles here. And what, what do battles do? They make soldiers. They make soldiers. Without battles, there are no victories. Without battles, there are no soldiers. Without victorious soldiers, there are no triumphs in making the word of the Lord true. So the voice of God is going to do all those things. And battles also do this. They prepare you to celebrate the victory. They make you appreciate victory, and God intends for that to happen. They make you to be ready, to be prepared, Hallelujah. and to know that there are battles, but to be ready for the voice of God Thank when it sounds, because this is our fight, this is what we can do. Our fight is to be ready to hear the voice of the Lord and to enact our faith. Battle is the Lord's. His voice is there to sound to win the victory. We need to be in his will. Amen. So that we can be good soldiers and part of the prophetic vision and fulfillment that we see that needs to be done. And whatever battle needs to be won here, the thunder of God's voice, it'll come to bear. It'll strike like the flames of fire that are written in verse 7 there. It, it'll shake up the world. Thunder shakes things. It'll shake the pillars of this world and the nations of this world. Maybe, maybe even the thunder of God. You know, psalms are songs, right? Here, here's a thought. Maybe the thunders of God come in song form to sing them. It's just a possibility. Just a possibility. What happened at the creation of the universe when the sons of God shouted for joy? And then all, all things were made. Amen. That would shake things up. That's up for the Lord to decide. I don't know. But the Psalms, they are songs, right? So in whatever way it comes forth, that's for the Lord to know. And it's his honor. It's his power. It's his majesty. It's his glory to reveal. I'm just offering possibilities to stimulate and get thinking spiritual thoughts. And what John was not allowed to write will make itself known. Not by the world at large. They won't know what's going on. They'll just look at it in political terms and, and environmental terms, you know, and, and all the judgments poured out. They won't see it by revelation of what is happening. But to those that hear what the Spirit says, they'll have understanding. And that's why we have to hear. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Amen. And these righteous decisions that God will make, they're written. Perhaps with, hidden, hidden within the context of other scriptures, that's known unto the Lord. It's our present duty to pay attention to that which we do know and, that, and what can be known right at this moment. All right, seventh voice, foundation to prophetic witness. In verse 9, the voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve, or the animals, whether they're of the horn type or a young calf, but it bring, it's creation power. It brings things to the birth. The lo voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve and discovereth the forest, and in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. I think the thunder of God's voice will make everyone in his temple speak of his glory. I can say that much. Amen. And if you have the seventh voice that thunders in its power, oh, what a mighty day that'll be. To the utmost degree, this shows creation power, the kind that brings life to birth. And life only has one ultimate source, and that's found in the everlasting spirit of truth that God most certainly is. He gave us a name to call upon, that of Jesus, at which every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord. He brings life into our spirit. He gets us born. So he'll bring things to the birth. He'll make the hinds to calve. He'll produce life, cause life to spring forth so that all men will know. Amen. That's what God will do. So this scripture brings life to the birth and does so by laying every secret bearer or is put here. It discovers the forest. Now, uh, in a mental image, put this thought uh, within. Put in uh, your mind the picture of a forest 
where every tree, even the cedars of Lebanon, had been laid down by the voice of God that thunders. Think what that would look like. It reveals all things. The voice of the Lord, it's going to lay every secret bare. Everything's going to be known. All the things that governments and, and the enemy has tried to do and hide, tried to hide, and, and it's all going to be revealed. It's going to be discovered. Amen. Within these things. And what's all this speak to? It speaks to God's glory. It puts God in his temple. From where does Christ rule in the millennial? He rules in his temple. There, as he comes to his temple. And symbolically speaking, at times, let's include this thought, at times, when Jesus said, destroy this temple, in three days I'll raise it up, he wasn't talking about the literal temple, but he was talking about the temple of his body. So when we read here that in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory, is that open to the possible interpretation of everyone that is within his will, everyone that's in his temple, everyone that's within his perfect will, within the body of Christ, they're the ones that speak to his glory of what's been done. I think the scripture's open to that interpretation. Again, I'm trying to stimulate thought and uh, look for the signs of the times. It's up for God to establish these things, not myself. We have to be humble. God has the answers, but thank the Lord for the seeking and the finding. The, what's Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3 say? It says, call unto me and I'll show you great and mighty things that you don't even know yet. That's what he said, uh, Jesus said to Nathaniel, you, you'll see greater things than these. Believest thou me because I said I saw you under the fig tree? You're going to see greater things. So what's God's voice doing? It's preparing you to see greater things. Amen. Amen. It's... It's the greatest thing ever. At the most pivotal time since the cross itself and crucifixion day, secrets will be shown. Even as it was when David, the, uh, or excuse me, Daniel rather, the prophet made known Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Nobody thought Daniel could turn that trick. Nebuchadnezzar didn't want his magicians and astrologers. He obviously didn't trust them much said, you have to tell me the dream. Well, we can't do that. But there was one who could, and Daniel made known the dream. All right, and that wasn't done by Daniel's wisdom. It was done by the great revealer. So God will discover the force. He'll lay every secret thing bare, and there won't be anywhere to hide. There won't be anywhere for anyone to go to get away from the wrath of the Lamb. And then to finish out in verses 10 through 11. The Lord sitteth upon the flood, yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. What do thunders do? They put him on the throne. And he's going to sit there forever. Amen. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. What's the voice of God do? It gives you strength. And it gives you peace of confidence to knowing that the battle is the Lord's and it will be done. How will the Lord give strength? How will he give peace? By his voice. God's going to speak. When you see the Lord high and lifted up, when you hear his voice speak, that, that's going to give you strength like you've never known before. It'll bring peace into your spirit and confidence. It'll lift you up to translation faith level. So as the first and second verses of the psalm say, give the Lord the glory that it's due him. Praise of worship, that's indeed the point where we make contact with the Holy Spirit, keep the communication open. God just didn't institute worship just, to, uh, just for his self-satisfaction. It provides a very valuable function. It keeps our communication lines open. And praise is the gift that we can give back to the one who's given us all things. He's given us everything. So we bless his name, and we get blessed by inheritance and in return. And then the voice will utter forth. And the lion of Judah, he'll roar. Who will not fear? Who will not fear when that voice comes? You can either fear him in the way of trying to flee from the wrath of the Lamb, from the judgments and outpourings of wrath, or you can fear him by saying, the Lord is the strength of my life. Amen. I've made him holy within my heart. He's the Holy One of Israel who came to us, the Word made flesh among us. He came out, born in Bethlehem, came out of Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? 
the only thing that holy that ever was good because God, Jesus said God alone is good. The only good thing there ever was came out of Nazareth. And the sound of pure holiness came from there, being fulfilled the scriptures to the letter, and the red letter words of a Savior proceeded out of Nazareth. And that's our strength. These words that bring forth millennial peace, that put us in the temple of the Almighty God, put his coming to the temple there, where he will rule by the corrective rod of iron. And all, all God ever required of us was just a little bit of confidence in him, a sense of justice and a desire to be on the right side of things spiritually, have a little humbleness within our spirits. But what did mankind do? They loved darkness rather than light. It's St. John chapter 3 and verse 19. There was a darkness that men loved, so God had to speak. God had to speak. He had to appoint the rod and bring judgments. It's Micah chapter 3 and verse 9, paraphrasing. As the Lord's voice calls out to the city and the man of wisdom, and the, the man of wisdom will see the Lord's name and it will speak. Hear ye the rod and he who appointed it. As God's voice will make the world to see his name and the rod of iron and he who appointed it. So it's always imperative. You have to hear the voice of God's wisdom. And as it's written and as it's expressed all throughout Scripture, that's, that's how we keep, make a difference. Because God's sheep, they, they don't know the voice of strangers. So to do that, you have to know his voice. So there's no mistake. So we're listening. And the way to victory is knowing God's voice. It's, what, it's the way the devil tries to twist Scriptures. It's what he tries to do it for. Like his quoting Psalms 91 to the master there tries to twist scripture because he's, he's subtle. It was subtlety of deception which is so prevalent in our age as we're turned upside down by uh, every rumor that comes down the pike. Jesus said war, there'd be wars and rumors of wars. Boy, is that ever true. The devil's very subtle. He knows how to deceive. So we need to know the voice. We need to know it from let there be light to the thunder of God's voice. And what do thunders do? They cover the earth. They're full of power. They're full of majesty. They're upon the waters. They identify who's speaking and who's listening. They identify who has oil in their lamps and who doesn't. And the power and the majesty will be made known. It'll shake everything from north to south. It'll cover all points of the compass. It'll break the cedars of Lebanon, the powers of this world. Lightning strikes of judgment, they're written, strong, powerful, immediate. And they'll bring the very powers of nature into subjugation to the king. They'll discover, the voice of the Lord, it's going to discover all the dark secrets of the enemy. There won't be any place to run. There won't be any place to hide. No matter who says that for the mountains to fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb, that prophetic promise is brought to the birth and it has its full effect by the very faith of creation. And there's hope of the eternal kind, just knowing that, just knowing those simple basic elements of things, amen. And it'll give strength in ways known and unknown, beyond what I've said here. I don't know it all. I'm press, trying to help others press toward the mark and do so myself, but it's beyond what I know. God knows, he'll reveal. God's voice has promised that all things are his and the battle is his and he sits upon the flood of events of the latter days. So, be vigilant, be prepared, hear the voice of God, with heart made, heart made sure in his word by just the basics of our faith and know this, that God will indeed speak and he'll give strength and he'll bless his people with peace. God's voice, it will utter forth. Hold on to that with all that you have. It's written, and not only is it written, but it is thundered. And God's voice will win the victory, and it will usher in the coming of the King. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for the blessings of his holiness. Amen. It's a big subject. It takes a little time to go through it all. Amen.
but thank the Lord's brothers, sisters, come forth. You, you can have confidence and peace in this fact, that Jesus is coming back again. Amen. That's what we look toward. We're second coming people. We await the promise of the Messiah, which is to come. Thank the Lord. To behold his beauty and inquire in his temple, it's the greatest thing you can ever do. It's the greatest mission you can ever be involved in. These things of which the Lord has ordained for us. So let the scriptures speak to you by the thunder of their voice. In Jesus' name. As we bow our heads and pray, Sister Miriam plays through, Jesus is coming back again. Father, we thank you for being in on the foundation of all that is coming forth, Father. You've made us part of your glory. The glory is yours, but that glory you share with us. And give us crowns of glory in order that we may lay them at your feet in that day of the casting of the crowns. In that day when you put your foot upon the earth and upon the sea, these things will be accomplished as your voice will sound. Father, we thank you for being spiritually aware of the very deep things of God that call to the other deep things of God. As scripture upon scripture, they speak to one another through their holiness because it's all one voice. It's one work unified together. So, Father, may we, as a body of faith, be unified together. May we be held together by the bond of perfectness that your Holy Spirit gives us, Father God, and the love wherewith thou hast loved us. And as we dismiss, we thank the Lord for all those that have need of healing, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you've heard our prayer. We thank you that you lift us up in Jesus' name. We give you all the glory forever and ever through the name of Jesus in which we trust. Amen and amen. Well, thank the Lord for what he's given us. Thank the Lord for the sounding of his voice. Jesus is coming back again. Jesus is coming back again And we being the bride awaiteth him For this is the day of I will restore Jesus said it I believe that he's the Lord The Lord brings us from one accord For the message is the two-edged sword It's new each day and I'm on my way Jesus said it I believe that he's the Lord the word when it's preached is a fire it burns all flesh and self-desire for all men may creed are as a weed jesus said it i believe it he's the lord jesus is coming back again and we be the bride awaiting for this is the day of I will restore. Jesus said it, I believe it, he's the Lord. The word makes us of one accord. For the message is a two-edged sword. It's new each day and I'm on my way. Jesus said it. I believe that he's the Lord. The word when it's preached is a fire. It burns all flesh and self-desire. For all men made creeds are as a weed. Jesus said it. I believe that he's the Lord. Jesus is coming back again, and we being a bride awaiteth him. For this is the day of I will restore. Jesus said it, I believe in he's the Lord. The word makes us all one and accord. For the message is the two-edged sword. It's new each day, and I'm on my way. Jesus.
Jesus said it, I believe him, he's the Lord. The word, when it's preached, is a fire. It burns all flesh and self-desire. For all men made creeds are as a weed. Jesus said it, I believe him, he's the Lord. Jesus said it, I believe him, he's the Lord. Um, there's coming a shaking. It's on page 155. There's coming a shaking, there's coming a shaking, for the judgment of God is at hand. He'll shake the heavens, he'll shake the earth, he'll shake all there is that can stand. I hear the thunder, I hear the thunder, for time there's no longer delay. The fire is falling, the fire is falling, for judgment has come today. I see him coming, I see him coming, a flame of consuming fire. Oh, don't you see him? Oh, don't you see him? The King of kings and Lord of lords. There's coming a shaking. There's coming a shaking. For the judgment of God is at hand. He'll shake the heavens. He'll shake the earth. He'll shake all there is that can stand. Oh, I hear the thunder. I hear the thunder. For time, there's no longer delay. The fire is falling. The fire is falling. For judgment has come today. I see him coming. I see him coming, a flame of consuming fire. Oh, don't you see him? Oh, don't you see him? The King of kings and Lord of lords. There's coming a shaking, there's coming a shaking, for the judgment of God is at hand. He'll shake the heavens, he'll shake the earth, he'll shake all there is that can stand. I hear the thunder, I hear the thunder, for time there's no longer delay. The fire is falling, the fire is falling, for judgment has come today. I see him coming, I see him coming, a flame of consuming fire. Oh, don't you see him, oh, don't you see him, the King of kings and Lord of lords. 